Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, for our study here this morning, Hebrews 11. And as we are taking our Bibles and turning to that portion of God's Word, we will dismiss our youngsters, sixth grade and under. Lord bless them as they head down to Children's Church. Trust they have a blessed time together. And ask the Lord to bless our time as well. That would be great. Hebrews chapter 11, we're back in this text. It's been a couple of weeks uh, since we looked at the, the first part of this. Uh, two weeks ago, is by faith, Moses' parents uh, is what we looked at. We're going to pick up with some of that here this morning as we continue on in our study. Sounds like you're there. We're going to thank the Lord for the good morning, the beautiful morning, the beautiful weather that we're having. Getting a little dry out there from what I'm hearing. Uh, need a little bit of rain, but uh, we're happy to have beautiful sunshine and nice fall weather here. And so we're grateful. Uh, what a difference between the north and the south here. Uh, we had uh, mid-70s, and uh, it did get a little cooler at night. But boy, I'll tell you, I've been watching the temperature up here. You're down in the 30s at evening, and so that's a little on the chilly side. But uh, we're going to make the best of whatever the Lord gives us and grateful for the, the beauty of fall. Let's thank the Lord for the good day. Father, we're grateful again for our time here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to worship you. It really is a privilege uh, to be able to just come and sing your praises, uh, to open up your word, to hear it read, to be participating in the reading of it. Uh, Lord, now to really even study it here this morning, we're, we're asking you, Lord, to open our, our eyes, or really our mind, our heart, to receive the truths that you have for us here today. Uh, we're going to study really another hero of the faith, uh, one who exhibited faith over fear in a number of different uh, instances. Uh, Lord, I pray that it's not just a, a lesson, it's not just a history lesson, it's not just a reminder about Moses, but Lord, I pray that we're able to lift the truths of your word off of this sacred writ here, this sacred pages, and, and really apply them to our own lives. <clears throat> I'm praying, Lord, that you raise up more Moseses of our day and our time. May these people be found sitting right here this morning in this congregation, and Lord, for that, we'll thank you. So uh, I pray that you're going to do something special as a result of the ministry of the Word going forth. Work in hearts and lives. Draw us to yourself. Change us. Uh, may we be more like Christ as a result of our study. And, and then I pray, Father, we go into the world in which we live and uh, really demonstrate that faith uh, time and time again to the people around us. And Lord, for that, we'll thank you. Lord, you're a great God. Uh, we've already acknowledged that this morning, and we're looking forward to what you're going to do this hour, and we want to commit it all to you, and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a story that's told. Uh, books have been written. Uh, conspiracy uh, theorists, theorists uh, have, have believed that uh, there's some truth, and maybe not so truth, but it's a pretty well-known fact. You could Google it and check it out yourself, that during the years of uh, World War II, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of England, and uh, the British intelligence uncovered a secret from the Nazi top secret Ignema codes. Uh, the code that they were able to uncover was Operation Moonlight Sonata. This is all true. From that point on, we're not quite sure what all was was uncovered uh, from there on. Once they uncovered this code, it was that the, the Germans uh, were planning a very large attack on one of the major cities there in England. Um, many believed it was going to be the city of Coventry, which is just to the north of London. Some believed it might be London itself. They weren't quite sure. I do know this, that Winston Churchill, the prime minister, thought maybe London would be the place. He packed his bags quickly and headed for London itself. He wanted to be where the action would be. There's some skepticism with regard to that. Some believe that he actually knew that it was going to be the town of Coventry. And uh, it was a pretty well populated area. It was, uh, it was a production place, especially during wartime. So the, the, the British intelligence uncovered this secret and he was faced with a major decision. Uh, based on the intelligence that was given, do I evacuate the town of Coventry, or London for that matter, if it could be possible, or do I allow the Germans to raid that particular city for the further good of the war? If I uncover, if, if, I, if I evacuate the town, uh, the Germans will know that we have cracked their code. 
And uh, now they're going to go back to encrypting it again, and it takes a long time to be able to figure all that out. And so he was faced with a major decision. Do I let him attack, keeping the secret that we know what's going on for the greater good of the war in England as a whole? Or do I evacuate? What would you do in a situation like that? Well, the story is told that he believed that the benefits of playing the long game outweighed the short-term cost. And as a result, many lives were lost in that particular raid. I don't know how you could live with yourself with that kind of a decision. I don't know what you would do in a place like that. Uh, you're looking at long-term, not wanting to reveal to the Nazi Germany uh, that, that we know what's going on and we're reading all this stuff. There might be something bigger coming down the road. Do we protect our people? What do we do? And as indicated, he did opt for the long game as opposed to the short-term costs. Lives were lost. Decisions. You know, there are some decisions that are easier to make than others. I think I have read somewhere that, and I shared this with you before, and I checked the numbers just to make sure that, that on the average day, the average American will make some 35,000 decisions. 35,000 decisions you will make in the course of this day. Now, many of them have already been made, such as getting up, getting dressed, and coming to church. Uh, many of them are somewhat subconscious. We just do them without really thinking much about them, but they are decisions that are being made. Many of the decisions I found are, are related to food. I thought of you foodies, and one in particular. Cornell University has uh, discovered that there are uh, 226.7 decisions made on food alone every day. I thought, 226 decisions on food? Uh, again, you may not be thinking much about it, but you might start thinking you're hungry. Uh, and, uh, and up to a particular point in time, you're going about your day, and all of a sudden the stomach starts growling. Oh, I'm getting hungry. Maybe that's the first. Uh, maybe then, what do I want to eat after that? Uh, where am I going to eat? What's in the house? What's in the refrigerator? Oh, do we need to make some? Unbelievable. I don't know how Cornell did it, but they have come up with this idea that 226.7, they didn't even just round it off to 227, decisions are made on food alone in the course of one day. Uh, by the way, did you all eat breakfast this morning? Amen? Yep, some of you did. Some of you just got up and got going or whatever. Decisions were already made. Much of these decisions, as already indicated, are simple. Some are more complicated. Winston Churchill faced a very complicated decision. What do I do for the betterment of this war, the betterment of our country? Do I sacrifice some for the long-term gain? Decisions such as driving your car. We spent a lot of hours, almost 1,200 miles of driving this uh, one way here. I was thinking of that, from lanes to lights to lunatics. It's crazy out there. Uh, and, uh, and part of the reason why we drove through the night, we broke it up on the way down a little bit, but the traffic was just unbearable. Uh, it was, uh, we, we even got into, when we were from uh, Birmingham all the way down, we take 65 south at that point in time. Uh, they had the road shut down. Apparently, there was a fugitive on the run, and they shut both sides of the road down to capture this guy. Uh, we had first heard it was a hostage takeover. And, uh, then when, uh, and by the way, when you get off at an exit and uh, use a restroom or whatever, the, there's buzz. Hey, were you in that traffic? Yeah, we were. In, what was going on? Hostage takeover. Hostage takeover. Whoa. We did see some activity by the time we finally get up there, but, but it was just uh, sitting and going nowhere. And after a long trip, you're anxious to kind of get to where you got to go. But it's, it's crazy driving. So we started out Friday, uh, what night was that? Thursday night thinking, well, hey, we're just going to drive, and the traffic was just moving. And so we thought, if it's moving, we're moving with it, and uh, we just kept on going. But there is some crazy, crazy driving going on out in that world. Even the psychiatrist himself asked his patient one time, the patient was having trouble making decisions. Uh, are you having trouble, he said, making decisions? Well, the patient said, well, yes and no. Uh, well, I, that's, that explains it all. Uh, I, then I heard, uh, I heard about an individual who used to think that he was indecisive, but now he's not sure. So, so I mean, decisions, and you just don't know where to go. What do I do, and how do I do all this stuff? I remember, and I shared this message with you a number of times. It has blessed my heart. I heard I actually preached a couple times. Evangelist Tom Farrell, 
the title of the message, I think you can probably find it online even, A Little Thing That Makes a Big Difference. The little thing that makes a big difference, anybody remember what it is? It is your attitude. Your attitude makes a big difference. It's a little thing, but it's a big, it makes a big difference. And he would say that you can choose to have a good day or you can choose to have a bad day. But the bottom line is, it's your choice. Hey, listen, all of us are dealt lemons from time to time, but what you do with them makes the difference. And if you, again, choose to make lemonade, well, bless your soul. Or you can get sour and bitter about life, and listen, that's just called life, and it's going to happen. But again, it's a choice that you have to deal with. You have to deal with some of these things. It's life. Uh, life has those moments, and so what do you do with them? You're going to make a choice here in about 16 days for the next president of the United States. I'm not getting into politics here this morning, but listen, I hope you're praying about that decision. That's a huge decision. Uh, that will, again, uh, have an impact on your life right here in New Jersey. You think, well, that's the big national. No, listen, it will impact your life. Hope you're praying about your part in the national election. But that's a choice that you're going to have to make. And uh, I hope that you'll be involved in that particular process. Well, when it comes to Scripture, what about individuals that had choices to make? Well, you can start all the way back with the very first couple that was created, Adam and Eve. Uh, they were told not to eat of the fruit of the tree of, the good, of good and knowledge, and yet they chose of their own free volition to, to disobey God. That was a choice they made. That was a decision they had to make. Uh, what, whatever attempted them or drew them to that or what, whatever was formulated in their mind and, and said that, hey, we're going to do it anyway, they did it. And now we're still living with the consequences 6,000 years later. But it was a choice, a choice to disobey God. Well, today we're going to look at Moses one more time, an individual that had many, many choices to make. One of the scriptures that tells us here in this particular text here, look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. There are going to be several choices that Moses is going to make in his young and older life that will really alter the course of Israel. Moses, I want you to understand this, sat at a table where he ate the finest of meals. He wore the finest of clothes. He had the best of educations. He was comfortable in his work and suited his liking. He was treated with respect and dignity. Yea, I would say that he may have even been heir to the throne after the Pharaoh would have passed on. He lacked for nothing. He had it all. His wish was Egypt's command. Yet, he made a decision. He made a choice. He abandoned it all for the sake of his God. That is an incredible choice. And it was exercised by way of faith. I want you to think of Moses and the choices that he made. To say the least, not easy. But here's what you can understand as well with regard to decisions. Your decisions are often based on the value system that you have arrived at. And those values that you have arrived at are really based on your faith. So when you make decisions, it's deep-seated. It, it comes from the roots of our being, that, that, that we, where we have learned or grown or understood certain things, and they become our values, and then those values lead to us uh, holding a certain position, our faith. And based on that, we make decisions. That will certainly show up in the polls next week, or in 16 days. It will show up in the rest of your life as well. Two weeks ago, we looked at the decisions that Moses' parents, Amran and Jochebed, made with regard to hiding this child. They went ahead having the child. That was a big decision in and of itself. For again, they were told that male babies should have been killed. And if you had a male baby, throw them in the Nile River, get rid of them. Well, they chose to have the baby, protect the baby, and uh, the rest really becomes history. But listen, they, their life was in jeopardy for violating the edict of Pharaoh. It was a big decision. And in that particular study, we looked at the uh, parents' protection of Moses. And again, not fearing the wrath of the king. Uh, they had saw something special in that child. And I challenged you with regard to that as well. When you look at a person, what do you see? Uh, do you see a soul that will live for all of eternity? Uh, do you see potential written all over a person? Especially in our young people. Uh, do you see how they're formulating their life and where they're going with certain things? Uh, I hope that you see something special. Every child, every person 
is created by God, made in the very image and likeness of God, has purpose and meaning in this life. And so don't just look at people as uh, somebody that gets in your way or just another person. No, they're special. They're special to God. They're special to other people. And certainly Moses was looked at with favor upon his parents. Uh, they, again, had some strong positions, and they were willing to be bold and courageous in standing up against the king. Today, I want you to see something that's in addition to the parents' faith, something that's uh, in addition to their faith. I, I believe that, number one, in verses 23 and 24, Moses, by faith, really capitalized on his upbringing. He capitalized on that upbringing. Uh, we're going to talk about that here in just a second. Number two, I want you to see in verses 25 and 26 that Moses, by faith, seized the opportunity, often in a moment of time, just maybe briefly, but it was uh, seizing the opportunity that he had. I often like to remind you of that. Don't pray for opportunities with regard to witnessing. I believe every day you have an opportunity to witness. You need to pray that you capitalize on the opportunities. You step out your door, you have opportunity. In fact, you don't even have to go out the door. The phone rings or whatever it is. You have opportunity to shine for Christ. It's not praying for opportunities. It's praying to capitalize on those opportunities that the Lord affords us. And he does that every day. Uh, number three, uh, verse 27, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, Moses looked beyond the visible. He looked uh, beyond the visible. He didn't just see the temporal. Number four, in verse 28, he obeyed when instructed, and he entered, in verse 29, the unknown. I want you to think about those words. Moses capitalized, he seized, he looked beyond, he obeyed, he entered. All of those words are action words. All of them demonstrate faith in action. James would say it this way, you can tell me you have faith, but I'm going to show you my faith. In other words, faith is just not something to be talked about. It's to be demonstrated. And so I asked the question to myself, as it is to you, how have we demonstrated our faith just this past week? Have we again put faith to action? Is there again something that others can see? Have we capitalized on opportunities? Are we moving forward in our faith with regard to the world in which we live? Well, I attended church down there at the campus church last week, and I picked up some literature that was available. And this is an article that was written by Jeff Redlin. He is the campus uh, pastor. He's the pastor of the campus church there. And uh, I was reading that, and I picked up a number of things, and I thought, boy, that's kind of timely for the article and, uh, and the study in which we're having with regard to faith over fear. And uh, he wrote this article maybe some time ago, but here's what it simply says. He said, uh, the title of the article is, That's What It Was Made For. He said, I have a basketball that sits on top of a bookshelf in my office. It really wasn't made for an office shelf. It was made to be bounced, to be thrown, to be hurled, to be passed, to be pounded. Basically put, it was made to be used. Now, you know why that basketball is probably up there on that shelf. It was a commemorative basketball. It was maybe for a championship, or maybe, maybe he scored his 1,000 points in high school or whatever it was. Whatever it was, that basketball had great significance, and now it's resting on a shelf in his office. And he's looking at that basketball and saying, something's wrong with the picture. That basketball was not made to be put on a shelf. It was made to be used. He would go on and say this. I wouldn't allow anybody to even touch it because I was nervous that if it would burst, if it was dropped or deflate, if it was shot, or would otherwise fall apart if harshly treated. In a very real sense, the basketball would be worth very little if it couldn't stand up to the pounding it was created to endure. So allow me, he writes, to ask if your faith uh, is your faith, the shelf kind of faith or the using kind of faith. In other words, does it look good perched up high on some place where it is free from the pounding that is typical of life? Or is it the kind of faith that gets regular, sometimes even harsh use? I thought that was an excellent illustration. Where is your faith? On a shelf? Or is it being used? And as it's being used, it doesn't always come easy. You will sometimes get pounded by the world. You will get pounded by unbelievers. You will get pounded by the skeptics. But hey, listen, our faith is made to be used. It is to be action-oriented, action-driven, not just something that we talk about. Oh, I have faith in Christ. Well, where is your faith? What we're looking at with Moses is by faith, 
he exercised that faith in tremendous ways. Let's begin to look at again verses 23 and 24 by way of Moses capitalizing on his upbringing. Verse 23 we've already looked at, so we're not going to go into great detail, but I'll read it. Verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. The idea of uh, coming to years is the idea that it is probably 40 years of age. Moses' life could be broken down into three sections of 40. The first 40 years were spent there in Egypt. The next 40 years were spent out in the wilderness. And the last 40 years were spent leading Israel into the promised land or toward, toward the promised land. This could be verified by looking at some different accounts. One of them is Stephen's account of this in the book of Acts chapter 7, verse 23, where it, barely make, where it makes it very clear that he was about 40 years of age at this point in time in his life. So that made me really think about a couple of things. Moses capitalizing on his upbringing. I want you to think about this. We're not quite sure how old Moses was when he was turned over to Pharaoh's daughter. We know that he was found by Pharaoh's daughter, but he was still nursing, and so he needed some help. Uh, Miriam was able to find, happened, just happened to find, uh, a Hebrew uh, uh, mother who would be able to nurse that baby. That would be his own mother, Jochebed. Uh, how, all, how long did Moses stay with Amram and Jochebed while he was being nursed and, and cared for? Not quite sure. Maybe, let's say, three, maybe four years, maybe at most. But four years of age, maybe Pharaoh's daughter was like, where's my son? Where's my son? I'm taking him into my own home. I want you to think about that, those formidable years. Four years with maybe his mother and father and family. 36 years in Pharaoh's house with his daughter. Boy, what a difference. 4 verses 36. What an influence maybe those first four years had on this man's life. Now listen, I want to give some credit to Pharaoh's daughter. I don't know much about her. Scripture doesn't really allude to a whole lot, but it does look like she was a compassionate lady. She saw that baby and her heart was stirred. Uh, she could have just abandoned the baby. She probably was well aware of her father's edict that that baby should be thrown in the, uh, the, uh, the Nile River, even knew that it was a Hebrew baby. And yet there was something special about Pharaoh's daughter. He, she was willing to take him in, to, to love on him, to care for him, to meet his needs. That says something about this lady. I think it says something about her boldness and her courage. Can you imagine when Pharaoh heard about it? Uh, where did you get him? Oh, I found him down by the Nile River. He looks like a Hebrew to me. He is, Dad, and we're going to raise him. Can you imagine the boldness and the courage that that lady had to have to take this child and, and care for him? So I'm going to give Pharaoh's daughter some credit. Don't know all the ins and outs, but no doubt she probably had some input in his life. But I want to go back to those first four years of his life. Do you know those first four or five years of her life are the most formidable years of our life? The most formidable years of her life. They are, again an experience in our emotional, physical, social, spiritual, and cognitive development. Life changes, and life changes fast. It's not limited to those first five years, but those first five years are crucial in instilling in our young children some things, some values and positions that will really, again, encourage them in their walk through this life here. Some of the changes they'll face are good changes. Some are not so. But no doubt, those first five years will position that individual for life. Now, I'm not going to say it all remains there, but the first five years. On a personal note with regard to that, I can tell you that, uh, that uh, you know, we have spent a lot of time with our children, and uh, we have uh, many, many grandchildren, and several of them are adopted children. And uh, coming out of some of the homes that they have come out of, we, we still see the scars and uh, these children are now upwards of 12 years of age, and uh, the verdict is still not out. Uh, we're not quite sure where, where it's all going to go. Uh, I know they're in a great home, they're in a great church, they're in a great school. Uh, the Lord is blessing, they're loved on, they're cared for well. But I'm really uh, watching uh, closely and praying uh, that, that God is able to get through to some of these kids' hearts. Uh, can you imagine being... Uh, uh, coming from a home where, where Megan has uh, four, she has uh, five children from one mom, but, but four different dads. Uh, one dad is no longer living. 
Um, and, and I don't know where some of the other dads are. But I, I, again, and some of you know something about being adopted and, and uh, in, incredible life there. And I don't know if I want to get overly graphic. I, I, I just, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine that process. Even though we're involved in it to some degree, I, man, that child comes home from the hospital. That child comes, you love on that child. That child's yours. It's flesh and blood. How could anybody ever abandon that child? How could they turn their back on that child? How could they walk away? I don't understand it. Other than man is selfish and greedy and man's going to do his own thing. And, but some of you have weathered those storms. I know we have a couple of adopted folks sitting here. And praise God for parents that want to take you in and love on you and care for you and meet your need. And praise God that you, know, you haven't been scarred. Um, but, but that can't be said about all. Some come from alcoholic syndrome backgrounds and drug addictions and this, their, their moms are, definitely have influenced their minds and, and there's, there's some consequences to that. And so you're working through all that. It's unbelievable. Those, those first years are crucial in developing a child. And, and I'd like to submit to you that Amram and Jochebed capitalized on influencing that young boy for the Lord. Uh, you're going to see that he's going to make a decision at, the four, at, at age 40 to abandon all that he has been raised with. Again, the finest of, of uh, meals and education, everything he, could have, everything he ever wanted, he chose to turn, away, uh, turn, turn from and say, no, I'm going to identify with the people of God. I'm going to identify with the God of heaven. What would, what would possess a person to do that? Why would an individual do that? He had it, he had it made. Everything was his. And yet he said, no, there's something more important. I, I, I want to I give credit, I think, to the parents. I think they did something special there. I think they, again, capitalized on, on the opportunity of those first couple of years to really influence him. Moses understood that it was not fate. Uh, Moses, again, uh, knew that God had worked through his parents. And praise the Lord for godly parents that are influencing the next generation for the cause of Christ. It is huge. I submit to you that Moses seized the opportunity to take a stand for God, and I want to give credit to whom credit is due. I believe his parents certainly had a vital influence there. I certainly believe that even maybe Pharaoh's daughter had some influence. No doubt God gets all the glory. Moses had now grown to manhood. He was now 40 years of age. He was mature. He was delivered in his decisions. Yet he was not quite ready to lead the people of God. Moses had to learn another lesson. Forty years of age, Moses thought, well, hey, I think I've arrived. I mean, I understand the culture, I understand the language, I understand the people, I know the land. I've been here now for, for 40 years. With all of that, though, Moses would say, nope, nope, I, I'm, I'm, I got other lessons to learn. And so the story would tell us where he went out and slew the Egyptian who was um, offending the, the Hebrew person. And he killed and covered up his sin. And that was a decision that he had to make in a moment of time. Uh, with that decision, he would then flee to the wilderness for 40 years. And I really believe it was those next 40 years in the wilderness that, that God would humble Moses. Moses came from a pretty elite status. Had it all, not lacking a thing. He thought, hey, I have arrived. I am your man, God. I am ready to take these people out here. And God said, I don't think so. I don't think so. 40 years to the wilderness. Do you know when God came knocking on his door 40 years later? Moses, I have a job for you to do. Who? Me? Uh, I, I'm not. And there's about five excuses that Moses will give in the book of Exodus as to why he was not capable of leading Israel out of Egypt. Isn't it amazing? 40 years, what 40 years will do to a person. 40 years later, he is nowhere near ready, at least in his estimation. But in God's estimation, Moses, I got you right where I want you to be. Now you're ready to go back into Egypt and lead the people out. And so I thought it was kind of interesting when you look at his life to that end. Deliberate in some of his decisions, but at this point in time, he's not ready. He may think he's ready. Instead of occupying a line or two of the hieroglyphics on some obscure tomb, he is mentioned in God's eternal book. I say that's a higher and holier calling. Instead of being found in a museum as an Egyptian mummy, he is famous as a man of God. J. Gregory Mantle says, It is not the possession of things, but the forsaking of them that brings rest. 
Hey, listen, if you're wrapped up in the things of this world, you got your focus all wrong. Our focus is, again, on the things of God and the world to come. Don't let this world distract you from all of that. And Moses, again, was smart enough to see through that when he made some of these incredible decisions. So he capitalized on his upbringing, but he seized this opportunity. He chose, the Bible says in verse 25, look at verse 25, rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. He was willing, again, to identify even if it would cost him. Hey, are you willing to take a stand for God even if it will cost you? Cost you your reputation? Uh, cost you uh, some humiliation? Uh, maybe even cost you your job? Are you willing to take a stand for the cause of Christ? He said he was willing to do that, to suffer affliction with the people of God, then to enjoy, now listen to this, the pleasures of sin for a season. What was the sin that Moses was to face? What was the sin that he was saying, no, listen, I'm going to suffer with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin? Well, I really believe that, listen, the sin that he was avoiding was not doing what God wanted him to do. I believe, as James 4, 17 says, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Maybe in the heart of hearts there, Moses said, hey, listen, I know what God has for me, and that is that I'm going to be his next leader of the people of God, and to avoid that, to, to say, that, but I'm going to live in this, this lap of luxury and enjoy all the privileges that come with my position. Hey, listen, to do that would be sinning against God. That would be enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. And by the way, mark it down. Sin is pleasurable. Do not deny that. But don't miss the rest of it. It's only for a season. And when that sin is up, there's a price to pay. As somebody has rightly said, sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. Sin is costly. Do not get entrapped in it thinking, well, there's pleasure. There is pleasure, but there's a price to come. Moses' sin was, I got to do what God wants me to do rather than live in the pleasures of Egypt here. And so he chose rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God. Verse 26 it says that he esteemed the reproach, which is the shame, or the disapproval of Christ. Uh, that's interesting. Moses is identifying himself with the Messiah uh, because of his position, his leadership, yea, even as a prophet. In fact, Moses would go on and write about some of this in the book of Deuteronomy. Listen to what he writes in Deuteronomy chapter 18. In verses 15 and following, here's what God says. And this is the same penman that here is esteeming the reproach of Christ. Where was Christ in the Old Testament? Where was the Messiah? What did Moses know about the Messiah? And he's going to say, hey, listen, I'm willing to, again, be shamed and disapproved just like Christ. I'm thinking, wow, how did he get to that place? Well, here's what I do know. He would write these words in Deuteronomy 18. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet. That prophet would be none other than Christ himself. From the midst of thee, that would be from the Jewish people, and of thy brethren, like unto me, Moses writes. He would be human. He would be a man like Moses. And unto him shall, and unto him ye shall hearken. In other words, you're going to listen to this prophet somewhere down the road. Moses is identifying himself with Christ as an individual that would be raised up amongst the Jewish people. He would be human, and he would be one that would speak with authority and which would command respect of all people. He goes on and says in that text, in verse 18, I will raise them up, a prophet, from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put words in his mouth. He will speak with inspiration. Moses was the penman of inspiration. He was the one that God used to write the first five books of the Bible. But again, it's a prophecy with regard to the future Christ, the one that was coming. He goes on and says, And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it goes on from that text. By the way, this could be supported in the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. So a couple different places where Moses, again, recognized the position that he had, and somehow, in some way, he saw this being fulfilled in the Messiah, the Christ to come. The decision is an incredible decision. And again, we could read more texts in the book of Acts chapter 26. We could read in Genesis chapter 3. Why don't you think about that text there? Moses, again, the penman of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. You know what he wrote in that text there? It's the first prophecy of the deliverer to come. Moses would write these words in Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman. This is again God speaking to Adam and Eve. And between thy seed and her seed. This is, again, differentiating between the offspring of woman and the offspring of Satan. 
And it goes on and says in that particular text, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. In other words, Christ would suffer a, a serious wound. He would die, but he would not stay dead. The fatal death would be to Satan, and Satan really is on death row as we speak. So Moses is dependent on all this, and somehow, someway, he soul in all of that Christ. That's a fascinating passage of Scripture. Verse 26, He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Greater riches. What were the greater riches? What was, what was, what was the value? What was he looking at here? He esteemed, he, he, he saw the reproach of Christ greater riches. I want you to think about Egypt again and some of the wealth. In fact, some of my reading, it took me to uh, King Tut, who was about maybe 100 years or so after Moses. Uh, I, I believe it was in about 1920 that they uncovered in, his, in King Tut's pyramid a, 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 uh, a gold face mask that, was, uh, that, that weighed some 25 pounds of solid gold, which would be well over $800,000 worth of gold just in a face mask. I don't know much about King Tut other than he died at a young age, and there were some good things about him where he restored some religious liberty to Egypt as opposed to his father and things of that sort. But, but the wealth was unbelievable that took place there in Egypt. And Moses is saying, or at least by way of this text and by way of his faith, that he esteemed, again, the reproach of Christ's greater riches. Again, the, the, the greater riches here, uh, unreal. He had respect unto the recompense of the reward or the payment of the reward, meaning that he saw the blessedness of heaven. It would be much like the songwriter would write, in turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It is amazing how that happens. When you get your eyes on, on, on the things of the Lord, the things of this world grow strangely dim. Because it's not lasting. It's, it's temporal. It's shallow. It's here for today and gone tomorrow. We're not taking it with us. And Moses said, hey, listen, you can't entice me with all the wealth in the world here in Egypt. I'm going to identify with the Messiah. I'm going to identify with his people. I'm moving forward in that area. And he did it all by faith. Moses, by faith, capitalized on his upbringing, seized the opportunity and moved out. But then I like this. Look at verse, uh, verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, he, uh, for he endured, as seeing him who is invisible. Moses, by faith, looked beyond the visible, and he saw that God was in it all. Hey, do you remember that song we like to sing with our kids? I'm going to see if I can get it all right. Twelve men went to spy out Canaan, ten were bad and two were good. What do you think they saw in Canaan? Ten were bad and two were good. Some saw giants big and strong. Some saw grapes and clusters long. Some saw, here it is, God was in it all. Ten were bad and two were good. You ever do that with kids? You remember doing that with kids? Okay, well, there's our next Awana song. And kids love it because then they go faster and faster, and you've got to get the thumbs moving all in the right directions, all that kind of stuff. But listen, I want you to think of that. Remember the 12 men to one spy out Canaan? Only two saw that God was in it. Only two. And I began thinking, I wonder what the percentages would be today. Of all those that profess faith in Christ, how many really have that kind of faith? Hey, where would you have been in that lineup? Hey, I want you and you and you and you and you to go check out that land. What, would you, what report would you come back with? Hey, two of them said, hey, God's in it. I don't care how tall the walls are. I don't care how big the giants are. My God is in it. Moving forward. That's faith. That's faith. That's seeing the invisible God. That's, again, that's, that's moving forward, trusting God again to work out his perfect plan. I wonder where we would have fared in all that. Think we would have come out on the 10 or on the 2? Again, I want application to this, folks. I don't want to just teach you another lesson that you already know about Moses. The question is, where would you be in all that? Well, by faith, again, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Uh, the wrath of the king. As already indicated, the first time, Moses thought he was up to the task. And, he, and, uh, and uh, he, he thought he could lead these people out, but because of the incident of killing that fellow Egyptian, finding out that Pharaoh maybe now knows about it, he fled for his life. Out to the wilderness he goes for 40 years. But then God, again, has already indicated, comes knocking on his door 40 years later and says, Moses, I want you to go back. I've got a job for you. And now this time come around, Moses has no fear of this king. 
No fear. I want you to think about Moses. You remember, remember, remember him marching, as it were, into Pharaoh's courtroom, per se, at least down by the river or wherever it was, and said, hey, hey, Pharaoh, by the way, uh, these people need to let, be let go. Let my people go. We're going out to worship. Not going to happen. Plague number one. Plague number two. Plague number three. Plague number... Hey, do you think his life was ever in jeopardy with all that stuff? Do you think like, hey, I'm going to kill that guy? I'm going to kill him and end this stuff here? He couldn't touch Moses because God had his hand of protection upon him. He didn't have any fear of the Pharaoh the second time around. First time, man, if he finds out that I killed that guy, my head's on the chopping block, regardless of who I belong to. Second time around, he's ready to go, and, uh, and it was evident by his life. The Bible goes on and says in that text, he endured. In other words, he persevered. He admits, or amidst all the trials and the difficulties that were connected with this, he was, again, willing to lead the people. He endured. As seeing him who is invisible, I already mentioned that. He saw God. All doubt was removed. God would sustain him. God would care for him. Hey, isn't that the nature of faith? You can probably quote this with me as well. Faith sees the invisible, it hears the inaudible, it touches the intangible, and does the impossible. Is that your faith? Is that where you are? Hey, do you see the invisible? Do you hear the inaudible? Do you touch the intangible and do the impossible? That's people of faith. And Moses was one of those individuals. Hey, by faith, Moses capitalized on his upbringing, seized the opportunity, looked beyond the visible, and here, verse 28, simply obeyed when he was instructed. Look at verse 28. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Through faith, he kept the Passover. I, I'm still a little fuzzy on some of this. I, I know that Moses was instrumental in instituting, promoting, and encouraging the doing of the Passover. He is the one who it started with. Uh, I don't know how much the Passover was observed in their 40 years of wandering through the wilderness. Through faith, the Bible says, he kept the, po the, pa the, uh, the Passover. Uh, it was faith that, uh, that he was confident that, that God would would fulfill his promise to his people that, hey, listen, you take the blood of that, that lamb and sprinkle it on the doorpost, your child will be delivered. And Moses instructed his people to do that. And they did just that. And the people were spared. Those that chose not to lost their firstborn. Moses believed that the Passover would be celebrated as a perpetual memorial of this great deliverance. Moses, again, would write more about it in later books, such as Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The sprinkling of blood, well, that goes without saying. The Passover lamb sprinkled the blood on the lintels, doorposts of the house, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Hey, by faith, Moses capitalized on his upbringing, seized the opportunity, looked beyond the visible, obeyed when he was instructed, and last but not least, he entered the waters. He entered the waters. Verse 29, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians a saying to do were drowned. The idea of a saying they were attempting to do. The Egyptians thought, hey, if they can do it, I can do that too. Oh, no, no, God had a different plan. But here's, I want you to think about this faith here for just a second. You know, we're, we're people who, uh, we're, we all have phobias to some degree, some more, some less. Maybe the phobias are, and I've talked about this before, of heights or close spaces, water, airplanes, boats, all kinds of phobias. Do you think the people had any phobias back in Moses' day? I want you to picture this. Their backs are really up against this Red Sea. Here comes the Egyptian army. They're, they're in a dilemma. What do we do? God, in his miraculous way, parts the water. Now, all of a sudden, that large body of water, and it was large enough to swallow up the Egyptian army, so don't let anybody ever tell you, well, it was just a short part of the, the Red Sea. It was large enough to swallow up a whole army. Parts the Red Sea. Here's these walls of water. And Moses then says, go, go, get going. You think the first one would be in like, is that thing going to come crashing down on me? Like, I mean, I want you to think about that, honestly. See, folks, we had the advantage of having the finished story. We know that they all passed. Almost upwards of 2 million people passed, not just on wet, soggy, mucky ground, dry land. They passed. But I wonder what it would have been like to be one of the Israelites getting into, into that position. Like, really? You want me to go? See, we just see the picture. We've all seen the picture of this trail of, of Jewish people walking through the Red Sea with these walls pulled back. And we think, nothing to it. Are you kidding? I mean, never saw before. Never happened before. Never experienced anything like that. 
I wonder, are the, if I get halfway through, am I going to drown? Are those walls coming down? I, I don't know. But hey, listen, by faith, get in the water, get going, get in that river, get crossing. And off they went. I can only imagine as the last ones were crossing and the Egyptian, Egyptian army was hot pursuit, that they turned around and looked. And at the right time, at the right place, the walls caved in and swallowed up the Egyptian army. Pharaoh himself, I believe, the Bible makes it very clear. All of them were swallowed up, drowned to death. Amazing how that works. But hey, listen, that's the faith of Moses. And I really believe that's what he's saying here. By faith, they, Israel, passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, attempting to do, later on were drowned. What phobias, what fears do you have that keep you from living a life of faith? Uh, there could have been some of the Israelites said, not me, I'm not going through there. No, -uh, no way, no way, you go, you go, you go. Well, hey, that would be to their loss. And folks, when we allow fear to trump our faith, we lose every time. We lose every time. Folks, that's just the way it is. I, I hope and pray that you're not a person of fear. Uh, the, the whole goal of the, se the series this whole year is really, again, to trust the Lord, to step out of our comfort zone, to believe that God, what he has promised in his word, will come to pass, to walk by faith and, and live by faith, not just to claim our faith, but to put our faith in action. These were the action words. Moses capitalized on his upbringing. He seized the opportunity. He looked beyond the visible. He obeyed when instructed. He entered the unknown. All demonstrations of his faith. My question to you as it is to me, is your faith on a shelf or is it being used the way God intended it to be used? Where is your faith today? I hope and pray that if it's on a shelf, you'll get it off today. Start living your faith, demonstrating your faith. Put some action to your faith. Show the world in which we live that you believe in the God of heaven, the God that you came to worship here today. Just come to church is not enough. Oh, that's a witness in itself. That testifies to the world in which you live, but it's not enough. And I pray that as you leave here today, you'll again demonstrate this faith wherever you're to be found. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time in your word, and it is just that. It's your word. And I do pray that, that we would glean some truth here from the life of Moses, an incredible servant of yours. And yet, Lord, as we, as it were, almost lift him up and exalt him, we, we need to understand that he was made of the same material that we are. He was of flesh and blood. Uh, he had his challenges, no doubt his doubts. He was not perfect. He was a sinner who needed to be saved by grace. He believed, demonstrated his faith in you, and then acted on that faith throughout his life. And Lord, I do pray that you help us to be that kind of a person as well. Help us to learn from Moses' example, from his life. Lord, I pray that we'd be a people who truly capitalize on the foundation that was laid for us, maybe early in our homes or maybe when we first came to Christ. Lord, I pray that we'd be a people who seize opportunities day in and day out, not just let them pass, but really capitalize on those. I pray, Father, that we'd be a people who look beyond the visible. Lord, it's easy to, to have faith when it's tangible. But Lord, I pray that we would see the invisible God who's in it all. I pray that we'd be a people who, by faith, obey when instructed, and a people who enter the unknown, trusting and believing you. And Lord, for that, we'll thank you. Help us to get our faith off the shelf and put into action. And may you get glory, for it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Well, folks.